Well, good morning, church. Um, preschoolers, you are dismissed. Those going to the preschool class. I apologize if my voice uh, cuts in and out today. I am recovering from some allergies. Uh, I am allergic to cold viruses, I think. And so I'm feeling good, but I realize my voice is going to uh, cut in and out at times. So uh, please open up with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28. I want you to have Matthew 28 open up in front of you, but do not get too comfortable in Matthew 28. Okay, hear me now. Do not get too comfortable with your Bibles open to Matthew 28 that you are not ready to go to another passage of Scripture. Okay? You might, you, know, you might be thinking to yourself, well, Grant, how do I stay ready to go to another passage of Scripture? And it's a little, it's a, like, and, and you might be asking, where are we going to go after Matthew 28? And that's a legitimate question. You're, you're wondering, where are we going to go after Matthew 28? And listen, I will tell you where we're going to go when you need to know where we're going to go. But for right now, I'm telling you just to stay ready. Okay? Stay ready. Are you guys ready? You're ready to go? I don't, I don't know if you're really ready, uh, but, but here are some ways that you can stay ready, okay? If you're asking, okay, how do I stay ready to know where I'm supposed to go? Uh, the first way is to just merely recognize that this is something I've asked you to do. Uh, if you recognize that I'm at least asking you to do this, to stay ready, you will at least have some healthy pressure and feel somewhat obligated to stay ready, knowing that I have asked you to stay ready. So that's the first way that you stay ready. Just recognize this is something I've asked you to do. Another way you can be ready to go to another passage is to keep listening to me. Don't tune me out. Like you heard Matthew 28, and now you're just going to tune me out for the rest of the, the sermon time. No, you, you can't tune me out. You have to keep listening to me. You have to stay in communication with me because what I told you in the past will not be enough for you to get to where I am going to lead you. You have to keep listening to me. In order for you to be ready to go, you also, you can't fall in love with Matthew 20. You can't fall in love with this page in your Bibles. You can't fall so much in love with this page that you're not willing to say goodbye to it and turn to the next. That's a way you stay ready to go. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to trust me that when I tell you to turn in your Bibles somewhere else, you're going to have to trust me that I'm going to lead you to somewhere good. I'm still going to have you in your Bibles. I'm not going to tell you to pull out another book or anything like that. I'm going to still keep you in your Bibles, and you're going to have to trust me that wherever I lead you next, it will be good, and it will be what is best for you. Now, if you're picking up what I'm laying down, or if, as some would say, you're smelling what I'm stepping in, <laughs> You probably realize that I am talking more, I'm not just talking about turning pages in the Bible, I'm talking about turning the pages of your life. And I'm talking about having a heart like God's heart, a heart that is ready to go and willing to send. A heart that is ready to go and willing to send. A heart, you see, a heart that stops listening to God a heart that falls in love with the page of life that it's currently in, a heart that doesn't trust God to take them somewhere good, that is a heart that is in maintenance mode, not mission mode. And our God is a God whose heart is in mission mode. The Son was ready to go. The Father was willing to send. The Spirit is ready to go. The Father and the Son are willing to send. God is not operating in maintenance mode in his universe. He is in mission mode. And the question is whether or not we're going to join him in that. And so may God help our hearts be like his this morning. We want our hearts to be in mission mode, not just maintenance mode, not just maintain mode. And so, so we just heard Brendan Read the Great Commission again, and let me remind you what we learned last week from the Great Commission. In Jesus' commission, we learn why we go, how we go, and who goes with us. First, remember why we go. We go because God is worthy of more worship and glory. 
We learn that missions exist because worship doesn't. We go because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, and therefore we go. We also remember how we go. We go making disciples. We go baptizing and teaching people to observe all that God has commanded us to observe in all areas of life. We go compassionately. We go patiently. We also go courageously because we remember who goes with us when we go. And church, who goes with us when we go? Jesus. Jesus goes with us. And his presence goes with us. Through the indwelling Holy Spirit and through his body, the church, Jesus goes with us. And it is God's presence that provides us the power to be, our, to be witnesses in our homes, in our church, in our city, in our county, and to the ends of the earth. But are we ready to go and willing to send? That's one question I want us to consider this morning. Are we ready to go and willing to send? Are we going to settle into maintenance mode or go into mission mode? And so let's ask the Lord's help. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we do ask that you would give us a heart like yours. We ask, Lord, that you would help us be ready to go and willing to send. We ask, Lord, that you would show us what our part is to play in this great commission that you've given to your followers. Father, we lift up to you another Harbor Network church plant this week. We lift up Boise Gospel Church in Idaho. Lord, they're, they're celebrating a, a, a big praise this week as they've been gifted a building. Um, a building that they had been meeting in, Lord, has now been given to them. And God, we ask that you would bless that transition as they move in and settle into that building. Please give them unity and wisdom and peace in how they handle owning a building and stewarding a building well. We ask, God, that the building would not become a distraction, but that it would be a good discipleship tool for the church. We pray, Lord, for more elders to be raised up and installed. And, and we, Lord, we pray for the marriages of those elders, that you would protect those marriages, that those would be healthy marriages, God. We ask that you'd bless all the elders and future elders and their wives. We ask, Lord, as, as uh, Pastor J.D. has asked for prayer from us, that, that they would have an increasing amount of maturity and zeal to be able to share their faith with others there in Idaho, God. So we ask, Lord, your hand of blessing upon them. We thank you for their partnership in the gospel. And we ask, Lord, now that as we look at your word, that you would teach us and transform us and may you be even working now in our hearts to make us ready to go and willing to send. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 1. Are you guys still ready? Yeah. All right, Romans 1. Let's go, Romans 1. In order to be ready to go and willing to send, we must first understand that we have an obligation to go and to send. This great commission is not the great suggestion. This is a command. This is a Christian duty and obligation that we have until the mission is completed. And the Apostle Paul understood this in Romans 1, 14 and 15. He says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. You see, God's word tells us that as Christians, as, as recipients of God's grace, as those who belong to Christ, we now have certain obligations or duties. This is, God's word teaches us these things, that there are obligations we now have in our households and with our families. There are obligations we have in the local church that we are a part of. And then there are obligations that we have to those outside the church. And this word that Paul uses, obligation, it's getting at the idea of being in debt to those outside the church. Paul believed that he was a debtor to those who had not heard 
and believed the gospel. And when you're in debt, you feel a pressure or obligation to pay off that debt, don't you? I mean, there's a sense of urgency when you're in debt. There's a, there's a healthy pressure on you to pay off that debt. But now, now, let's understand this. There are two ways to really be in debt. One is to borrow money from someone, and then you are in debt to them until you can pay them back. And that's not the, debt that, that's not the kind of debt that Paul is talking about here. The other way you get into debt is like when grandparents give me money to go buy gifts and spend on the boys. Once I receive that money for that purpose, I'm now obligated or in debt to my boys until that money is shared with them. That's the kind of debt or obligation that Paul is referring to here. And it's the same debt or obligation that we have to our neighbors and to the nations. We've received this glorious and gracious gospel message that is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And we are now obligated. It is our duty, and we are debtors to those around us and to those on the other side of the globe who've never heard the good news about Jesus. And if God doesn't wake up your heart to the obligations and debts you have, you will never be ready to go or willing to send because you won't feel the God-given pressure or sense of urgency that you should have from God that moves you out of maintenance mode into mission mode. A heart that is in maintenance mode feels no obligation to their neighbors or to the nations. But a heart in mission mode lives as a debtor to the unbelieving world. This is an obligation we have, church. And we really only understand the obligation we have when we see that the salvation and the life we have is all a gracious gift from God to us. And it, all this grace that we've received from God, all these blessings we've received from God through Christ, they were given to us to be shared with others. God the Father sent God the Son, and God the Son willingly came to us to rescue us from darkness and bring us into the light. And now he's now equipped us with his word and with his spirit to be ambassadors and missionaries for him, to extend the grace of God that we ourselves have received. This was all by God's grace, church. You must understand and see that our life and salvation are given to us all by God's grace. Because when God's grace empowers you, when God, God's grace grips you, when you see that this was nothing that we deserved or earned on our own, but it is all by God's grace, now all of a sudden we have that God-given obligation to go share this grace with others. This is something that God has asked us to do and he has already willingly demonstrated to us his willingness to go and to send. God is not asking us to do something that's different from his own heart. He's ready to go and willing to send. But this leads us into our second point this morning, that in order for us to be ready to go and willing to send, we must be able to see God's grace at work in the midst of all the mess, all right? In order for us to be ready to go and willing to send, we must be able to see God's grace at work in the midst of all the mess because mission work is messy work. And do you know why it's messy work? It's because it involves people. Any work that involves people is messy because our sin has made a mess out of everything. Now, some of you can't operate in a messy environment. We all have different personalities, but, but there are those of you that if there's any sort of mess, you really can't function at all. Now, I can't really relate with those of you that feel that way because one of God's graces to me is that I can operate in a, in a mess. 
Uh, before marriage, uh, my college dorm room, you could not see the floor at all. It was covered with clothes and books and snacks, and in that environment, I thrived and flourished. <laughs> I currently have over 15,000 emails in my inbox that I just, they're just there. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I haven't decided yet. I don't know if I'm going to delete them or reply to them. I don't know. They're just there. But some of you, even, even with that digital mess, that would stress you out so much that you can't even listen to the rest of this sermon until that gets cleaned up. Now, dirty floors and full inboxes are, are not really the mess I'm talking about. I'm talking about the messiness that sin leaves in our lives. That's the messiness I'm really talking about. That's the messiness that we still need to be able to see God's grace at work in the midst of all the mess that sin has made. And so some of you have really clean houses, but the mess in your marriage hasn't been picked up in years. Because there's really only one way to pick up the mess that sin has left. And that is by believing and living out the gospel of grace. Practically, this looks like confessing sin, repenting of sin, and forgiving sin. That's really the only way I know to pick up the mess that sin has left in our relationships. It is to quickly confess sin, repent of sin, and forgive sin. You, the, the relationships you have will always be in a mess until you pick the mess up, and the only way to pick that mess up is to confess sin, repent of sin, and forgive the sin. Now, the more sin there is, the messier things are. And so mission work is messy work. But if we are to be ready to go and willing to send, we must be able to see God's grace at work in the midst of the mess and be encouragers, not discouragers. And so let's look now at the example of Barnabas, who he is gifted with being able to see God's grace at work in the midst of the mess of the church of Antioch. So turn with me now to Acts 11, verse 19. You should be ready to go. Acts 11, verse 19. Barnabas, whose mama named him Joseph, was given the nickname Barnabas because it means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. He was an encourager. And isn't it just great to be around an encourager? Man, there's something really refreshing about that. And I'm not talking about someone who just flatters and lies to you. I'm talking about someone who really encourages you, who can, who can see through all the mess that sin is making in your life, and they can see the grace of God at work, and they can encourage you in that. They can come alongside you and instill courage and cheer in your life because they see God's grace at work. What a gift it was to the early church and to the mission of God to have Barnabas. Because listen, church, it's easy to discourage people. A lot of us are really good at that. I mean, and anyone can do that. Anyone can discourage someone. It almost comes naturally to us, right? It just flows out of us to be a bit pessimistic, to see the, the worst things about people, to, to squelch the joy and enthusiasm we see might start to be rising up in some people. There are people who walk into a room and they can only see the mess and they can't see God's grace at work in the midst of the mess. And so they're discouraged. They become discouraged. And discouragement is, is really, really contagious. And so a discouraged person oftentimes discourages everyone else around them. And church, we have... We have plenty of people like that in the church today. But in order for the Great Commission to be completed, we need some more people like Barnabas. What a gift and what a necessary part of the mission of God it is when a Barnabas walks into a church and encourages people. Now, Antioch was one of the larger cities in the Roman Empire. It's in modern-day southern Turkey, northern Syria, that region, and follow with me now in Acts 11, and look at what happens here in Antioch. Acts 11, verse 19. 
Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Let's pause there and just say it's interesting to note that sometimes the Great Commission is accomplished by means of persecution. What the enemy intended for evil, God can use for good. It was because of persecution that the gospel gets to Antioch. And it comes to Antioch by unknown, unnamed preachers. Look at verse 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, we don't know their names. We only know here that where they were from. But these preachers proclaimed the gospel in Antioch. And little did they know that from Antioch, people were going to be one day sent out to eventually the ends of the earth. Church, the Great Commission is being accomplished by many people that you've never heard of. But even though fame or popularity isn't with most people accomplishing the Great Commission, they had something much better than that. Look at what they had in verse 21. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So what we have here is we see, this, we see an initial missionary and evangelistic effort here in Antioch, and people believe, and they turn to the Lord, and the church back down in Jerusalem hears of this, and they send help to Antioch so that disciples can be made and a local church can be established. Look at verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came... And saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted or encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, which means he was full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Okay, Saul, which most of you know, also called Paul in the scriptures. Saul was his name amongst the Jews. Paul was his name amongst the Gentiles. It wasn't necessarily a pre-conversion, post-conversion name thing. It was more just in, in the different context. And so Barnabas goes looking for Paul, and verse 26 says, And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now don't miss this. Barnabas is able to see the grace of God in the midst of the messiness of all these new believers coming to Christ. He's able to see the grace of God, and it says at work, and be glad. And yet, at the very same time, he sees that these people need help. <laughs> and more help than he himself can give them, okay? So this isn't like, hey, Antioch, everything's going well here. You know, he comes in, he sees the grace of God at work, but he also says, I'm going to have to go get Saul for this. We need a year of Saul, it's like seminars from Paul for this, for this people, right? These people need to be taught and discipled, and it's going to take more than a couple of weeks, and they're going to require more than even Barnabas can give, can give them, and so he goes and he gets help. But stop for a second and just notice what th this superpower that an encourager has. I, I think sometimes people prone to discouraging others think encouragers are just naive or simple-minded. But look at what Barnabas can do here, and look at what an encourager can do. They can see that people need help, but they can also see and be glad about the grace of God at work and encourage the people. And church, we need to be able to do both. We need to be able to do both. The Great Commission needs both. Some of you are really good at seeing how people need help, but you can't see the grace of God at work in their life, and you're discouraged, and you're discouraging others. Some of you are really good at seeing God's grace, but you don't see how people need help, and therefore you don't get people the help and the need that they really need. The Great Commission needs many encouragers like Barnabas who can see the grace of God at work in the midst of messy people who need help. 
and they can come alongside and they can encourage. They can instill courage and cheer and come alongside people and give them the help they need. And here, Barnabas does what we see happen many times in the early church. On one hand, there was an attempt by Paul and his missionary efforts to raise up and install elders from within the churches. But at the same time, there was also no hesitation, and it doesn't seem like Paul and Barnabas are afraid to go get outside help for the churches when they need it. For example, Paul sent Timothy to teach and encourage the church in Corinth. We see this in 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 17. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 17, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in the church. We also see that Paul sends then later Tychicus to encourage the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 6, 21. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And so we see in the Great Commission that, yes, people need to be discipled and raised up. Elders need to be installed in local churches, local gatherings of believers. But we also see at the same time we need some missionary efforts. When a church is just starting to grow or when it needs help, when it's hurting, we need to be ready to go and willing to send to go strengthen and encourage the hearts of believers outside of our own local church. And so Barnabas goes, and he goes, and he gets Paul, and he brings them to Antioch. And verse 26 says that for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Christians. The name Christian means one who belongs to Christ. And it was likely first used by those outside of the church who would mock Christians. But sort of like the title given to Jesus on the cross, the King of the Jews, uh, it, it, it was a title that was truer and more beautiful than the people using it in a mocking way could even comprehend. And so let us not throw off the title Christian too quickly, but let's actually embrace and believe what it means. We are one's who belong to Christ. That is our hope in life and death, church, that we are Christians, that we are ones who belong to Christ. And so this morning, if you're struggling to know how to encourage a brother or sister this morning, how about just reminding them that they belong to Christ? They belong to Christ. And may we all be a bit more like Barnabas and be able to see the grace of God at work in the midst of the messiness of missions. May we see the help that people need. And may we go get help and send help. But may we also see the grace of God at work and be glad. You belong to Christ. And everyone who turns to Christ belongs to Christ. A heart that is in maintenance mode is quick to be discouraged and discourage others. A heart that is in mission mode sees the grace of God at work all around them, and they encourage those around them. They're full of the Spirit and full of faith like Barnabas was. In order for us to be ready to go and willing to send, Point number one was we must first understand that we have an obligation to go and send. In order for us to be ready to go and willing to send, we must also see God's grace at work in the midst of all the mess and encourage one another. Be encouragers. The Great Commission needs more encouragement to be completed. And finally, in order for us to be ready to go and willing to send, we can't fall in love with the pleasures of this present world. 
Turn with me just a, maybe a page over, just look into Acts 13, depending on your, your Bible, but just go over to Acts 13. We can't fall in love with the pleasures of this present world if we're going to be ready to go and willing to send. Acts 13, verse 1 says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. You see, the church in Antioch, I mean, they've had a sweet time together. They, they've, they've got multiple prophets and teachers here. I mean, this is, they're, they're, they're loaded, right? They, they don't have to worry about who's preaching next. They, they've, got, they've got a group. They've got a crew of teachers. They've been getting now good teaching for well over a year, but look at what they're doing. They're not getting comfortable. They haven't gone into maintenance mode. No, they're in mission mode because not only are they still praying and communicating with God, but they're also fasting. They're fasting. And fasting, I I think we need to, to teach a little bit more on fasting here, which we will in the future, because I do think we probably need to follow in the example of the church in Antioch and have occasional days of corporate fasting and praying for some things that are coming up. But fasting is one way that we can help keep ourselves from falling in love with the pleasures and the comforts of this present world. John Piper, in his book, A Hunger for God, which is a book I'd recommend to you if you want to read more about fasting, he says, fasting is a way to reveal to ourselves and confess to our God what is in our hearts. Where do we find our deepest satisfaction? Is it in God or in his gifts? If you want to see how much you comfort yourself with food instead of God, try going a day without food. And not only does fasting help reveal what's going on in your heart, not only does it reveal what you're depending upon, what you're leaning on for your strength, but when we experience physical hunger, this adds an element of urgency, fervency, and focus to our prayers. If you want to add a level of urgency, fervency, and focus to our prayers, this is what believers throughout the ages have done. Many brothers and sisters in the faith who have gone before us, they were hungry enough for God that they wanted to say it with hungering bodies. They went without food to remind their souls who they should really be hungering for. Many brothers in the faith and sisters in the faith have urgently and fervently sought the guidance of God and the salvation of souls and the completion of the Great Commission through fasting and praying. And if you want to talk more about fasting, you can certainly talk to me. There's certainly healthy and unhealthy ways to do this. Everyone's medical conditions are different, and I'm happy to talk with you through that, but we will have more teaching on fasting sometime soon. But being ready to go and willing to send, it requires not falling in love with the pleasures of this present world. And this requires embracing some pain. Embracing some pain. Church, completing the Great Commission is going to be painful. We must be ready to embrace some degree of pain. Being ready to go and willing to send will sometimes hurt our bank accounts. It's going to hurt. We must be ready to embrace some degree of financial pain. Being ready to go and willing to send, it may even cost us some relationships. I mean, think about this, church. Being ready to go and being willing to send means that we will at times have to say goodbye to people. 
which I think is one of the reasons we don't urgently and fervently pray for people to be ready to go and willing to send. I mean, what if God actually hears us? And what if the Holy Spirit actually tells us to go? I mean, how scary would that be? And what if he actually sends people that we really love and we don't want to see go? And this was starting to stir in some of your hearts last week the reality that a part of therefore going will inevitably mean saying goodbye to people. And we experience this as a church in a very, very small degree every time we multiply city groups, don't we? We multiply city groups. We, we say goodbye to the people that we've been close with and seen on a weekly uh, uh, time together. But we do it because we're on mission. And we want to welcome more people into the fellowship that we have. But imagine what it will feel like when some of you are set apart to move somewhere else or to plant a church somewhere else or to go on mission somewhere else. But church, if we are to be ready to go and willing to send, to send we have to embrace some pain in order to not fall in love with the pleasures of this present world. A heart in maintenance mode will avoid pain at all costs. A heart in mission mode embraces some pain, knowing that God can use pain to help us keep him as our first love. And so, church, may we not settle into maintenance mode, but may we be a church that is in mission mode. When the, when the Titanic sank, there were two ships in the vicinity. The closest was about 20 miles away, but it had gone into maintenance mode. It had shut down for the night. It had turned off its radio about 10 minutes before the Titanic hit the iceberg. And the crew of that ship, they saw some flares shoot off in the distance, and they thought it was strange, but they never really investigated. Surely the Titanic would never sink. They never turned the radio back on to, to reestablish communication. And, and for the rest of the lives, the crew members had to wrestle with why they didn't turn the radio on. And when I read about that ship, it reminded me of what a, a prayerless Christian and a prayerless church is like. Oh, we've, we've, you know, we grew up in church. We've heard God say some things, but we're not going to keep communicating with him. What in the world if he asks us to do something? What if he asks us to go somewhere? What if he asks us to give up something? What if he asks us to confess something or forgive something? No, I'm just going to put it into maintain mode, into maintenance mode. I'm not going to bother myself too much with what's going on around us. I mean, I see there might be some trouble out there, but I'm not going to really look into it. Then I'm going to have to feel guilty about it. Let's avoid pain at all costs. Let's cut off communication with God, because what if he tells us to do something that's going to be painful? No, let's just maintain what we have. Let's stay comfortable here. Let's settle in for the evening. But then there was another ship, and it was about 60 miles away, but its radio was on and ready to communicate, and when they got the call that the Titanic was sinking, they powered up all engines and ran full power for three and a half hours and got there to at least save some of the people from the lifeboats. Church, I believe that this next season of Franklin City Church will be very pivotal for us. We've kind of got through the planting and getting established, getting going phase of a, of a church plant. And now we will have to choose if we are going to settle into maintenance mode or press into mission mode. Are we ready to go and willing to send? Do we recognize that this is something God has asked us to do? We have an obligation to go and to send. 
Are we able to see God's grace at work even in the midst of the mess here and still encourage one another and not discourage one another? Are we praying with urgency, fervency, and focus? Are we falling in love with the pleasures of this present world and our present season that we are not willing to embrace some pain and let go of some money and relationships and some dreams? Are we trusting that wherever God takes us, that he will be with us? Are we ready to go and willing to send? Well, church, there is a family in our church who is ready to go. And so I'm going to invite David and Sarah Moore up along with their kids, Zeke, Cadence, Judah, Meredith, Reuben, and Nellie. And they're going to share with you uh, what God has been doing in their heart and where God is leading them and and calling them to. And this will be the first of many uh, times uh, that, that we talk about this and pray over this. Uh, but many of you don't yet know what's uh, been going on in the Moors' uh, lives, and so I wanted them to have a chance to, to share with you, and then we will, over the next few months, be giving you more updates and spending more times in, in prayer for the Moore family. So, David, why don't you uh, share a little bit just what's been going on and, and how God has led you to where you guys are at right now? Yeah, sure. Well, good morning. Uh, good to be with you guys. Uh, so some of you know that um, Sarah and I, as my wife Sarah, for those who don't uh, know us, I'm David, and these are our six children. Um, we, we had um, gone on mission trips as teenagers, and this was really impactful to us uh, when we were growing up. And it was something that I felt like I really wanted for my kids someday, uh, because it was a really worldview-shaping thing. And we've continued to be involved in missions in different capacities. And so uh, here lately, as we've, uh, in the last several years, the Lord has uh, put on our heart to um, go on a mission trip together. Uh, Instead of just sending our kids, I really had a heart to, why don't I lead my kids and we all go do something uh, that we can do together, especially in this window of time before they're grown and, and moved out. And so um, we've been praying about this for a while, and um, we um, uh, have all, probably about a year, we were, we were talking about it, we were praying, and asking where the Lord would have us go. Um, we ended up getting in, in contact, um, long story short, with One Mission Society. Uh, they're based out of Greenwood, Indiana, and they have missionaries in a lot of fields around the world. Uh, and uh, OMS essentially... Um, they, they brought us several opportunities, many of which didn't seem to kind of fit or stick, but um, in October, they brought us an opportunity to actually go to Japan. Uh, OMS has a campus in Japan, and uh, they, on this campus, they've got um, seven buildings that are old buildings that were built in the 60s and are uh, somewhat run down. Uh, the missionaries that were there have retired from the field, and so they were trying to figure out what to do with it. So at first we were thinking, what, you know, okay, Japan, we don't think of Japan as very needy, as maybe a very needy people. But as we've started looking into it, we've really seen that uh, actually Japan is very spiritually needy. Uh, even though they have affluence, they are um, very lost and so uh, the, the number of Christians there are less than 1%. And so they're actually one of the largest unreached nations in, in, on the earth, really. Uh, so le- as far as size, uh, the, uh, Japan is about the size of California, but with three, more than three times the number of people. So you imagine 126 million people and less than 1% are Christian. So uh, they have a great need there, and it seems like they've kind of gone under the radar a little bit, at least even in our lives and other people that we've talked to. So uh, the more we began talking with OMS and learning about this opportunity, the more we felt in our spirit like this was where God was calling us. So uh, what we're going to be doing there, um, essentially what OMS is is looking at for us is um, they have this 
they have this campus, it needs work. Um, they were trying to figure out what to do with it. Should they just get rid of it, turn it over to the church in Japan uh, that is there? But what's happened is they started getting calls from people who are saying, I feel led by the Lord to go to Japan. They weren't initiating this. They weren't sharing this, really. There was no initiative going on from their standpoint. But they said they could have as many as 14 new missionary units, singles or couples, in Japan in the next two to three years. And they're not ready for that many people to be coming, even though they've got potentially a space for them. So what what we've, we've prayed about and, and what we're looking to do is um, coming alongside them and going for a, a two-month span uh, and this is another thing that we kind of had uh, on our hearts was not just going somewhere for a week or two weeks, but going for a longer period of time. So we're going to actually go at least two months and we're going to be working on this campus and we're going to be uh, repairing these homes and preparing them for missionaries to come in uh, ahead of or you know, behind us essentially and kind of getting ready for that. So um, we're excited about that because we like working together as a family. Um, you know, we're a hardworking crew. And uh, this is something we've done several times. We've been involved in real estate, worked on our own home a lot. So um, I think it's something that we have to offer. And um, another thing that's going on on the campus is uh, they have children coming um, in from the neighborhood, from the community. They've got a basketball court there. They've got a field. And kids are coming in. And uh, they're opening it up. And they're starting to play sports there and um, they're able to get involved in connecting with the neighborhood and the community right around the campus so we'll be able to do that the kids will be involved in in that as well so um, kind of an outreach that will connect uh, with the japanese uh, families right there so um, and one other thing is uh, the men for missions teams um, oms has these uh, mission short-term mission teams that can come over and we'll be able to help lead those to tackle some bigger projects as well so there's going to be a wide range of things that we can do in that time. Um, we're, we're really excited about that work and the possibility, so we're really kind of gearing up now. We've officially applied and been accepted to the position, and uh, we're, we're moving forward with that. So um, that'll be happening this fall in uh, September. We'll be leaving in September, Lord willing, and um, we are really excited about it. Um, and if anybody else wants to go as well, uh, wants to do a short-term trip, We'll, that's an opportunity that there will be, uh, will be available coming up. Uh, so maybe be thinking about that, praying about that. If you wanted to go for a week or two, um, there may be, maybe there will be a group going from here and, um, and work on your, get your passport because that's the thing that takes the longest. If you had it all uh, an inkling, you might want to go. But um, that's, that's what it is in a nutshell. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, yeah, you guys can give it up for them. I mean... <laughs> I think, you know, when we see brothers and sisters take steps of faith, uh, it is an encouragement to, to all of us. And so we want to come alongside uh, the Moore family and, uh, and join them in this. And that's going to look different for, for different people in here. But as a church, we want to make sure we are uh, surrounding them in this and we're with them in this. And uh, how maybe uh, what's one or two ways we can be praying for you guys right now in sure. this current season? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, two ways. Yeah. Uh, one, for the Japanese people themselves. Just there's a lot of hopelessness there. Um, they've gone down a path that is very um, work-centric. The families are broken because the dads are just gone all the time, married to their work. And um, they have a very high suicide rate. So uh, it's the leading cause of death in men ages 20 to 44 is suicide. So it's a really hopeless um, feeling that they have in their culture. And so we're praying that they see a great light and an awakening on a large scale uh, that they would come to Christ. So pray that the Holy Spirit moves on their hearts and um, we just get to be a small piece of what God seems to already be doing the way he's calling other people to the country. And then for us personally, um, really just that we would trust the Lord in this work and uh, for, for everything, for his strength, because uh, we feel weak. Uh, we feel like we can struggle to get through even just regular days here. Uh, and I know a lot of us can feel like that, but as you start moving forward with things like this, um, you really start to feel insufficient to the task. And we do already know that we are, but um, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna give up. We wanna trust the Lord uh, that he's gonna empower us 
to do what he's called us to do. And um, as much as we may struggle um, on a day to day, we may um, we want to look to him for where our strength's going to come from. So please pray for us that we would be encouraged that way, um, because it is, you know, you can really start to feel quite small and like, what are we doing? This is big and crazy. So, um, so yeah, if you could pray for that. Yeah, let's pray, church.